for the most this amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and the blue true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and love and wings and of the gray, gay, great happening illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any, lifted from the know of all nothing, now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are open. This poem by E.E. E. Cummings has long expressed for me the exuberance and joy of each day. Joy is related to happiness, but implies a deeper spiritual connection. A number of years ago, William Schultz wrote the book, Joy, Expanding Human Awareness. In the prologue, he tells of the birth and early years of his son. I suppose it all started when Ethan was born. The idea about joy had been rummaging around for some time, but he crystallized the feelings behind the rummaging. He emerged via natural childbirth, Lamaze's method, and I was there. I saw him enter the world, get turned upside down, cry a little, and then stop, get cleaned off, wrapped up, and put in my arms. As I looked at him, he was very quiet and very curious. He lay quite still, concentrating on the blooming, buzzing confusion, apparently in trance. For an hour, we held him, and he was warm and close and peaceful. I even found myself trying to explain what he was getting into, and he listened carefully. I kept thinking that this might be the most important hour of his life. What a way to begin by giving joy to his parents. The joy continues. When Ethan smiles, every cell of his body smiles, including his turned up toes. And on it goes. He is joyful and gives joy. He wakes up each morning eager for new adventure. Maybe today it will be a piece of string, or the toilet plunger, or the telephone, or pots and pans. His joy is contagious. Babies and young children express a pure joy. It is always touching when in total innocence our five-year-old granddaughter says, I love you, Grandpa. As the children and we grow older, life becomes more complicated and complex. Our expectations, hopes, and aspirations are thwarted. We have problems. We can get discouraged and disappointed. But a joy in living can sustain us. I remember Bill Clark, a chaplain for AIDS patients, describing a particularly difficult time in his life. He was very discouraged and went for a walk along the beach to sort things out. While walking, he came upon a group of people trying to help a small whale washed up on the beach. He joined in, and as he began to help, his whole mood changed. Bill felt in touch with the universal life force. With these strangers working together to try and help this creature from the deep, in the presence of the power and majesty of the ocean, Bill felt a oneness with life. He was overcome with an inexplicable feeling of joy. The experience and its memory <clears throat> have helped sustain him since that time. Paul Pearsall, in his book, Joy, describes one of his clients who was in therapy. He calls her Claire. She is over 60 years old. All her birth records, including her birth certificate, were destroyed in a concentration camp in Poland during World War II. During therapy, Tears streaming down her face, she described losing all but two of her family members in the prison camp. She was tortured and was within days of being killed, but fortunately the camp was liberated as the war ended. Claire was in therapy to seek ways of getting closer to her son and his wife. Paul tried to open communication between them in family therapy sessions. He wanted the couple to see Claire, to see the Claire he saw. <clears throat> a strong, happy, celebrating woman who had every right to hate the world, but instead loved everything about living. 
In time, the son and his wife learned that if they slowed down their lives and took the time to be with her, they could appreciate the remarkable woman she was. During one of the sessions, Claire was looking at the number tattooed on her wrist. Paul asked her about it. She said it was a symbol of the cruelty she had experienced in the concentration camp. It was a sign to remind her to live and to love. She said it could be a heart instead of a number and asked, we all have a sign, we just have to look for it. She asked Paul, have you found yours yet? During their conversations, Paul became fascinated with Claire's faith. While in the camp, her mind had told her, you're crazy, you should be afraid. Her mind wanted her to surrender but her spirit took over. She added it was never easy. She was not a hero. Claire had thought of giving up. If I had listened to my brain, I wouldn't be here now. Something was arguing against surrender. Something telling me to hope, to wait, and see. In the camp, she found pleasure in simple things. One day, she found an old badge discarded by one of the guards. It was rusted. But to her, it became an imaginary star of David. When she got down in the dumps, she would look at her imaginary star. Sometimes Claire would contemplate looking out for herself and her family only, and just forgetting the others in the camp. <clears throat> but she couldn't do that. She knew they needed one another. Selfishness would only kill all of them more quickly. Small gestures were of great help in the camp. She would hold one man's hand every morning when the guards came in. He would shake terribly as they stomped by, but her hand gave him strength. And, she admitted, holding on to him gave her strength, too. One day in therapy, she, took, she opened her purse and took out a yellow paper, handling it as if it were a fragile bird. There's my contract with me. I read it when I lose my happiness. Claire didn't know the source, but later learned it was from a course in miracles. The paper, given to her by the man in camp whose hand she had held each morning, read, Perception can make whatever picture the mind desires to see. Remember this. In this lies either heaven or hell, as you elect. Claire chose joy. Claire's experience dramatizes the interrelationship of all the spiritual practices. She was forgiving of the Germans so that her life would continue unencumbered. She was loving and kind to other prisoners, and she in turn was strengthened. She was sustained by finding beauty in an old badge, hopeful with a faith that sustained her. Claire was full of gratitude and joy and a vivid appreciation for life. Paul asked once about the source of her happiness. She replied, I think the question is wrong, doctor. I keep wondering why everyone is too busy to be happy, and yet seems to have plenty of time to be sad. It's just in me. I love life, and I learned to love it even more when I saw life treated with such disrespect, such disregard, when I was a prisoner. Maybe people just get used to life and living. Well, you don't get used to living when you can be killed at any minute. I will never take my life for granted. I will never miss a minute of it. My philosophy is, so what's so important that you can't laugh and love? That's why my family thinks I'm nuts. I want to dance, to love, to smile, to fight, and yell. They just don't have time for such silliness. Almost everything to them is a problem, not an opportunity. I just ask myself one question. What's the most important thing in the world right now? I always get the same answer. Life. Here's to life, doctor. To life. Paul Pearsall, in his book, Yes. Uh, um, 
two occasions every day to be thankful. When he got up in the morning and he came down, his car was still there. <laughs> and when he came home at night, his apartment was still there. <laughs> In, in uh, talking about the difference between happiness and joy, J.D. Uh, J. D. Salinger said that happiness is a solid and joy is a liquid. And if you think about that, you know, a liquid like water will flow through your fingers, so it's hard to harder to hang on to it than than it is uh, for a solid like like uh, happiness. <coughs> See, my thought on that is that um, happiness ties you to the earth, and joy sort of ties you to the heavens, that 